Contact. Enemy Moab incoming. Good evening and welcome to the second session of Vietnam 20 years after Voices of the War. We thank you for coming and we sincerely hope that tonight's program can contribute to your understanding of a phenomenon which still casts a shadow over our beloved country. As I stated this afternoon, it is our hope that with the lapse of 20 years since our combat forces departed Vietnam, we have reached the plateau of historical detachment which might allow us to survey the events of that war in a reflective, non-emotional manner and to learn what we can from our collective experiences there. We would maintain that if there's any validity at all to the study of history, then there is validity to examining the history of the war in Vietnam. To reiterate also earlier remarks for the benefit of those who may not have been with us this afternoon, our present occasion is not a scholarly symposium nor is it intended to be one. Rather, in the language of our students, it is Vietnam 101, a basic overview of the war in Vietnam and its attendant circumstances. There is a simple reason for such an approach. Most of you students assembled here from our own campus and from high schools, colleges, and universities across the Commonwealth of Virginia were actually born after our direct military involvement in Vietnam had been terminated. To you, Vietnam is a place name on the map. In the words, war in Vietnam may remind you vaguely of events that you've heard your elders talk about. Events that for you happened long ago and far away. Events that do evoke controversy still and emotion, ambiguity, and some mystery. Yet that same war has had a marked influence politically, economically, sociologically, and psychologically on the world in which you now live and which you are about to inherit. This evening we continue our deliberations with an examination of the People's War in Vietnam the revolution which was taking place in Vietnam and which we understood poorly, at least initially. The long struggle for the loyalty and the support of the Vietnamese masses. It is my distinct honor to introduce tonight's speaker. William E. Colby was elected to Phi Beta Kappa at Princeton University where he earned his AB degree. In 1947, he received a Bachelor of Laws degree from Columbia University Law School. He also received an honorary doctorate in public service from Norwich University in 1992. He has been admitted to the New York District of Columbia and U.S. Supreme Court bars. Bill Colby has a distinguished career in public service. He experienced his first taste of intelligence work during World War II when he parachuted in France and later into Norway to work with the resistance forces in each instance for the Office of Strategic Services. After returning from the war, he worked initially for the National Labor Relations Board, and then from 1951 to 62, he served in the American embassies in Stockholm, Rome, and Saigon, and from 1968 to 1971 was ambassador and deputy to the commander of the U.S. Military Assistance Command in Vietnam, where he directed American support for the Vietnamese government's rural pacification program. 
1963, Bill Colby was appointed chief of the Central Intelligence Agency's Far East Division, a position which he held until 1968. He also served as the agency's executive director and comptroller from 1968 to 1973. When he assumed the post of director of, Central, of the Central Intelligence Agency. Since leaving the CIA in 1976, Mr. Colby has been a consultant on international and domestic political matters to various corporations, governments, and investment organizations. He has practiced American and international law in Washington, now counsel to the Washington firm of Donovan, Leisure, Rogovin, and Schiller. He is also the author of two books. Lost Victory and Honorable Men. Parenthetically, if I were to select what I consider to be the three best books on the Vietnam War, Colby's book, Lost Victory, would be one of those three. He has garnered many awards and distinctions, including the National Security Medal, 1976, the Distinguished Intelligence Medal, 1973, the National Order of Vietnam, 1972, the Silver Star and Bronze Stars during World War II, and many others. To depart from my script just briefly, to personalize, let me say that this is one of the most magnificent guys that I have ever known. Not only do I consider him among my very best friends, but he has for years been a sort of role model for me epitomizing the traits of character, honesty, decency, and honor to which I also aspire. It was not easy for him to come here. He had a clear slate when he first agreed, and then his schedule collapsed on him. He has placed himself at some financial risk to keep his commitment, since to Bill Colby, honor is more important than money. Uh, I have to be careful now, I can see, how I ask him to do things. He has never turned me down whenever I ask him to do something. Uh, and uh, that puts a little bit of a moral burden on me to be more careful in the future. Listen up, please. Listen up. Bill Colby will tell you things about our almost two decades of involvement in Vietnam direct and indirect involvement, that will truly enlighten your understanding. May I present with great personal pride, William Egan Colby. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, what I call General Sam, although the word president has a nice ring to it, uh, for that nice introduction. In the old statement, I wish my wife and my mother were here to hear it. My wife would like it, and my mother would have believed it. <laughs> but uh, we are here for a very serious and important purpose, I think, to examine the histories of some of the people who played various of the roles in our long agony in Vietnam. The problems that we faced there, the kind of problems, military, political, all the others, yes. Domestic and foreign, yes. I come with one small credential, that I probably am one of the few Americans who spent most of the 16 years working directly on Vietnam in a position of some responsibility. I began in May of 1959, when the communists now admit they begin, began the war, and I arrived in Saigon on Tet 1959 in February. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a deliberate reaction to my arrival, I assure you. But uh, it so happened that it did begin with the same time I got there. And then I stayed for, as General Sam mentions, three and a half years, went home, ran the Far East Division, which was mostly Vietnam, 
for another five years or so, went back to Vietnam for another three and a half years, came back to Washington, had an administrative job for a year or so, and then became director at the time of the fall of Vietnam. So most people had about a one or two year exposure to Vietnam. They were there, some went back several times, two or three or four times, but very few people look at it as a continuum. To most Americans, Vietnam is a series of still pictures, dramatic photographs of dramatic events. 1963, the Buddhist priest burning himself in protest against the regime. The little girl running away naked from a napalm attack. The various other guys, the police chief executing a prisoner at the time of Tet 1968. There are various of those dramatic photographs which in most people's mind bespeak Vietnam. In truth, however, Vietnam was a moving picture. It changed over time from good days to bad days, from success to failure. And I think it's important as we look at the experience that we recognize those different elements of the history of our involvement there. I like to divide the experience into four pieces. The first from the beginning of the war up to 1963. There we see that as I said, the communists now admit they began the war in 59, and they began it for a very simple reason. One of the Vietnamese communist leaders paid a visit to South Vietnam at the end of 1958. He came home to report to his colleagues in Hanoi that indeed that fledgling little republic down there seemed to be taking off, economically, socially, not so much politically but it seemed to be gathering speed, and that their hopes that it would collapse of its very weight and they would be able to take power in South Vietnam as they had in North Vietnam, what looked like they would be frustrated. So that it was essential to go back to the People's War, which they had successfully prosecuted against the French. Their mark of that can be seen in the title they gave their transportation unit that set up the secret transportation links between North and South Vietnam. They called it the 559th Transportation Group. You say, why 559th? Well, May 59. And they are quite frank about that today, that that's when they began the so-called Ho Chi Minh Trail to begin to open that war. As I said, they approached it as a people's war. And the doctrine of the People's War was to get control of the population by a mixture of exhortation, uh, political inspiration, and some power to enforce their will over the population. Then pull the population out from under the government and it would collapse. Now they had made no secret of this basic strategy, but the American experience in Asia prior to that time had primarily been the Korean War, which was a soldier's war, not a people's war. The soldiers combated each other at the front. And so when the war began in South Vietnam, the American influence and the advice and support went to building up the Vietnamese military response to the, the war. And this started the long process of the Americans, either themselves or through the Vietnamese military, out after the enemy, because a soldier's job is to shoot the enemy or to make him surrender. And this was the thrust of the effort. We built up the divisions, we built up the artillery, we did built up the, the other heavy weapons in order to be more effective soldiers in that war. Well, since the enemy was not fighting a soldier's war, there was very little enemy to be found to apply this mass of power against. And so over the first couple of years, the enemy effort of seizing control at the local level, at the village level, seemed to be proceeding pretty well. I remember one particular program that the Vietnamese government had started in about 1959, which was to eliminate malaria. This involves sending teams throughout the countryside 
to dust with DDT. Now it's environmentally uh, the wrong thing to do, but we had eliminated malaria from Italy after World War II by exactly the te that technique. Unfortunately, the enemy saw this as a way of the government's asserting its position and its policies in the village areas. And so they began to shoot the teams. And the teams then gave up and malaria continued without much hindrance. Here was an example of the Vietnamese steps toward a people being frustrated by the people's war on the other side. Well, eventually the Vietnamese government, and I might say thanks to some of the work that some CIA people decided to try our own form of people's war. We went to a few little villages here and there, asked the village headmen whether they would like to defend themselves against the incursion of enemy squads or enemy groups. And to the answer, yes, they would, we were able, with the government's approval, to give them weapons, to give them communications, to give them some training, so that they would set up a small defense in the village and not be the subject of incursion by enemy squads. This we began as in a, what we call the oil spot system. You started in a fairly safe place and then gradually expanded it, the way a drop of oil will expand on a blotter if you drop it on it. This turned out to be quite successful during 1961, or during 1960 and 61, and the government then took it over and it became a major program for the government, so-called Strategic Hamlet Program. Now, it's popular to say that there was a certain amount of fakery involved in the implementation of the Strategic Hamlet Program, and it certainly was true. There was a certain amount of fakery, as some of the bureaucrats did not understand the political motivation behind that strategy, and instead thought that they could solve the demands for progress from the, their headquarters by wrapping a strand of barbed wire around a hamlet and therefore checking it off as protected, which of course it was not at all. But in fact, the enemy saw this program as a major threat to their basic strategy. And it began to concentrate on trying to stop that program from expanding. But nonetheless, during 1962, that program did expand and substantial areas of the countryside were included in this, in this program in an effective way and gradually expanded the area of safety for the citizens, the people, who wanted to be no truck with the communists. Now this went on until mid-1963. And at that point there was an explosion, a Buddhist protest against the Catholic minority which effectively ran much of South Vietnam and the Buddhist priest did burn himself and there was the kind of we must get rid of this modernization that the government event uh, is like. We didn't have the model then but we since have seen the Ayatollah Khomeini who had approximately the same views of how society should be run according to the dictates of the prophet uh, some 1300 years ago. Uh, that's what happened to Iran when that spirit got loose, and it happened in Vietnam when that spirit got loose. Mr. Rostow this, this afternoon referred to the difficult problem that the American government had in this situation. We wanted South Vietnam to be independent. We wanted the programs to work properly and not improperly. We had to deal with a very stiff and tough leader called President Xiam who really didn't like being told by foreigners what he should be doing, because he was a true nationalist without any doubt. His brother had a somewhat more intrigue approach toward life, and I know that because I spent many, many hours talking with him at different times. But he was generally involved in what he could define as an effort to find a new base for the elite of Vietnam, to find it in the villages, and not among the French trained elite. He did not go as far as Pol Pot did in neighboring Cambodia, who had the same objective to find a new elite, but produced, went at it 
by trying to kill the old elite, and of course did well over a million fellow Cambodian citizens in that situation. New's program was to expand this revolution, have it replace the old elite, and then have a new basis for Vietnamese society. Well, this created a conflict between the people who wanted change, wanted more freedom, wanted religious freedom, and the government which was trying to conduct the war. This conflict was translated into disputes in the United States between the different observers and actors in the American government. The one set, the, the, it's perhaps best evidenced by a famous case in which President Kennedy asked a military officer and a foreign service officer to go to Vietnam, come back in a week, and tell him what they thought about how the war was going. And when they came back, the military officer first reported and said that he had been in 23 of the provinces or some such number. He had talked to the military leadership out in the countryside. They said things weren't going all that well, but they were going, they were moving. The program seemed to be moving ahead with reasonable progress, that there was a lot more work to do, but that the, the turmoil, political turmoil, in the cities really had nothing to do with the war in the countryside. The Foreign Service officer reported that he had been to five of the major cities. He talked to a lot of, the, of people in those cities, both private citizens and government officials, and his conclusion from those conversations was that the government had lost all credibility, that the government could not rally the support of any of these people, even the officials within the government. President Kennedy listened to these two reports and said, did you two guys go to the same country? The tragedy is that they did. They looked at different parts of the elephant, as in the old blind man story, and they saw different things that they brought back. And the question really was which was more important, that what was going on in the countryside or what was going on in the cities? I make no secret of the fact that I thought what was going on in the countryside was the most important. But the fact is the president was under enormous pressure, a liberal democratic Senate president supporting a regime which had priests burning themselves in protest against it. We began to look around for alternatives to that president. And finally, it developed that there were some military officers who would be willing to try to run a coup against President Diem to replace him and have new leadership in Vietnam. After some vacillation and enormous fights within the American official community, the president eventually gave the green light so that, so that the signal went out to the generals, if you replace President Diem, the American assistance to Vietnam will continue. American assistance incidentally, had been terminated to a number of the programs in Vietnam to make the point that we were displeased. The generals reacted. Most of the generals had no idea that the president would be killed. One of the generals, the leader, President uh, General Duong Van Minh, so-called big men, had his aide go out and shoot both the president and his brother, just murder them. And that ended the Xiam regime. That's the end of the first chapter. It's not a very happy chapter. But, uh, there were some good things that began to work. There were others that didn't. But most of all was American involvement in the death of the president, even though America had no idea that that would have happened. The second act in, this, in the theater started with that fact. Three weeks later, of course, President Kennedy was assassinated and lest you think I have any doubt about this, with Mr. Oliver Stone coming tomorrow, by Harvey Oswald, alone. No question about it in my mind. But President Johnson was then faced with a problem. He had a chaotic situation in Vietnam. The generals who took over had no idea of how to run the country. They just knew they didn't want to do what Diem had done, so they did nothing. And we drifted along, finally another general threw them out, and we began a several year period 
of revolving door governments, one general, one civilian, another general, another civilian, while chaos characterized most of the area, without question. Now this then created a crisis, and the communists began to gather strength, without any doubt. Over the next several... Well, it was, it was clear that the communist objective was to eliminate the representatives of the Vietnamese government uh, in the small communities. They could eliminate them by chasing them away or by killing them. And they did kill a number of village chiefs, a fairly substantial number. Every year, a high number would be reported as having been killed. The most dramatic one was in Hue, the town we talked about, which the communists did control for almost a month, several weeks. And after they had been thrown out, we discovered graves, a mass grave outside of Hue, which had about 3,000 bodies in it, people who had been targeted among the elite in Hue who had been taken out and shot during the communist occupation of the period. Now, this was a fact of life. It was hard to get much attention to it because our attention went to the abuses and some did take place by the Americans or by our Vietnamese allies. There were certainly abuses. We know of My Lai, that was an abuse. And it was an enormously uh, terrible thing, but it also received maximum publicity. So the fact is that in any war, you're gonna get some atrocities happens all over the world. It's happening today in Bosnia. And yet, you try on your side to prevent it from happening, no matter what the other side does. Thank, Thank you. you. Next question, Adam. Um, yes. Uh, what I was wondering about is that you mentioned by about the uh, third stage of the history as you laid it out that we were pretty well able to hold off the Vietnamese attack and the South Vietnamese government was able to stabilize itself. Um, if we look at it that way, then, we could say, indeed, that the war was, was completely lost when we lost our will. For us to have won, it would have then taken the North Vietnamese to lose their will. Was there anything that could have caused the North Vietnamese to give up and for us to actually win? There was a lot of attention paid to that question during the war. I never paid much attention to the discussions of it because I thought that uh, Ho Chi Minh and the leadership were very tough people and that they were very determined people. Uh, Ho Chi Minh is quoted on one occasion as saying he doesn't matter how many are killed, he was going to keep fighting. And I think Ho Chi Minh would have kept fighting. There's no question about it. So it's not that he could be suppressed. We bombed Hanoi a little, some, as you know, but it wasn't a matter of getting them totally suppressed, but it was a matter of keeping them out of South Vietnam that I thought was the answer just as we successfully have done with Korea. That that was the model in a strange way, that the end result should be sort of like the Korean end result with a South Korea free and developing and a North Korea still communist, still under authoritarian rule. Thank you. Next question. Would the questioners be so kind as to state their names and uh, sort of where they're from, if a student, what college, and so on? Okay. My name is Thomas Ray, and I am a visitor from Nashville, Tennessee. You indicated um, uh, a minute ago that uh, you thought that it would have been preferable for the war to have been ended much sooner, uh, given the outcome. I heard back several years ago on television a documentary in which an individual was quoted, whose identity I do not know, um, who claims to have overheard uh, President Kennedy talking with his brother, Robert Kennedy, uh, who is known to have had some major reservations about the war even during the time that he was Attorney General. And in this supposed conversation that took place, which uh, occurred about a month apparently before uh, John Kennedy was assassinated, um, the, uh, the individual quoting this claims to have heard uh, a conversation something like this. Uh, Robert Kennedy protested uh, the continued involvement of the American troops in Vietnam, to which John Kennedy said something like, well, I'm giving McNamara one more chance. I'm sending some more troops over now, and if he doesn't succeed pretty soon, then I'm going to pull all of them out and give up on this. As we know, uh, not long after that, he was assassinated, and the control of all of this went to uh, President Johnson, 
who uh, relied very much on McNamara and his point of view and got us uh, more deeply involved. Do you know anything about this conversation or this, uh, this particular set of views and whether this may be correct? I don't know about that conversation. I do know that the subject of whether President Kennedy would have given up on Vietnam is very much debated still with indications of evidence in both directions. My own belief is that he would have given up after the 1964 elections, that he would have stayed in order to get reelected as president and not given up before then, which would probably have resulted in his defeat. But at that point, I think he would have limited further American involvement and certainly not gotten 550,000 troops in Vietnam. Uh, that's a belief. There are little flickers of evidence one way and the other that are around in the, in the various memoirs. I don't think there's anything definitive on the question. Bill Irwin. Good evening, uh, Mr. Colby. My name is Bill Irwin. I'm a senior at Hampton City College. You referred to President Diem's assassination as the end of the first chapter. What would it have taken on his part and his brother New's part to regain American confidence? And by the same token, it seems that the Kennedy administration in, made the choice of the lesser of two evils in acknowledging the coup. Did they believe that General Men would be an improvement and he would make a difference in our effort in Vietnam? This is a, a very tough subject. I was engaged in most of those arguments over the spring, over the summer of 1963 as to whether we should support President Siam or not. Having known him and having a lot of respect for him, I was one of those who was urging we continue to support him. Uh, but there were very substantial reasons on the other side. The fascinating thing about it to me, as I think back on it, is that I don't remember one serious discussion as to who would replace President Siam. It was the generals in sort of a vague way. Uh, well, you know, one of the first order of politics is you can't beat something with nothing. And here we were putting up nothing in order because we didn't like something. Uh, it's more complicated than that, of course. But, you know, you would have thought we would have done a very careful analysis of who would be the best candidate if we were going to support the generals in the overthrow of the president. I, uh, maybe I'm partly responsible for not having done that. I made my own estimate about who would take, take over. I dismissed pre, pre, uh, General uh, Min and several of the other generals. I focused on one who actually did take over later and then didn't do too well because he was too sympathetic to the Buddhists. I always thought he looked back on what happened to Ziem, who wasn't sympathetic enough with the Buddhists. He got overthrown, so General Nguyen Khan wasn't going to get into that position, and then he was too sympathetic with him, and General Taylor didn't like him a bit. Next question. I'm Michael from Junior. And I was wondering, uh, Mr. Colby, you had said that we had been prepared for Tet several months in advance because of our intelligence. And I was wondering why plans weren't made to better control the political fallout and the public relations uh, perception of Tet, seeing as we were prepared militarily for it, and then why there weren't better plans made to deal with uh, public opinion in the United States and on the world stage afterwards? Very good question. I don't think I said we were prepared for it two months ahead. I think we got our first really good intelligence about an upcoming series of attacks, particularly against Saigon, about a week or so ahead, as I remember, something of that nature. Uh, I don't think we anticipated a countrywide attack, uh, which was the feature of it that caught the news in the rest of the world. The fact that they went into some 30 or 40 cities in Vietnam at the same, well, on two nights. They got screwed up. They did, went into some of them on one night and some of them the other night. They meant to do it all at once, but the effect was about the same. Uh, I can't answer that question, why we didn't plan better for the public relations handling it. General Westmoreland did the best he could. He went down to the embassy the day after, 
saw the people who had been killed there, saw that they were outside the embassy, the embassy had not been touched inside at all, and uh, said that this was a massive defeat for the communists. This was derided as being absurd, but it was true. Thank you. Next question right here, please, sir. Uh, I'm Surrey Roberts from Raleigh, North Carolina, and I uh, am involved with the Mountain Yard resettlement in North Carolina, uh, peoples from the Central Highlands. And I have two questions. First, what is the future, in your opinion, of the Mountain Yards that are left in the Central Highlands? And second, why is it that the, the U.S. government has been so reticent in revealing information about the POWs immediately after the war and over the subsequent years? Well, with respect to the Mountain Yards' future, uh, it's bad. Uh, their future was never very good in a Vietnamese society. Vietnamese are a very strong society and they're inclined to eat up other societies as they push their way south. That's what the Cambodians are afraid of today, that the Vietnamese will extend their march to the south on further. And Prince Sihanouk is the biggest uh, advocate of that problem. Uh, the mountain yards are being carefully controlled by the communist government. They're afraid of them. They've arrested a lot of their erstwhile leaders and uh, they have tried to assert their full authority over them in the, in the mountains, in the mountain areas. The second question, uh, the POW issue is an enormous issue, of course it is. Uh, I think our government was mishandled by the Vietnamese. The Vietnamese have handled the POWs in the worst possible way during the war and after the war. My closest boyhood friend was a prisoner of the Japanese after Bataan. And yet when he was taken prisoner, his, his, his capture was reported to the Red Cross and his family notified. When he was moved to Japan, his family was notified. When he died in Japan, his family was notified. After the war, his remains were delivered to the Americans He's buried in the Manila Cemetery today. I've been there. So the, despite the intensity of the Japanese-American War and the hostilities, they did follow the basic rules of the Geneva Convention. The North Vietnamese never followed any of them. They didn't tell us who they had. They gave us some in 1973 at the time of the peace agreement. That was the main thing we insisted on. I remember one time speaking to Kissinger after the, that agreement. I said, Henry, did anybody believe the North Vietnamese would abide by this agreement? And he answered me, I thought, a very accurate answer. He said, Bill, you have no idea the pressure we were under for the POWs. That's right, because the North Vietnamese manipulated them, both the living and since then the dead, turning over a few odd bones to any delegation who then come home wagging their tails that they've made a great breakthrough in relationships, all that sort of thing. And the, the, the Vietnamese, North Vietnamese, Vietnamese communists have gotten themselves in a position that nobody believes a word they say, for good reason. Now they're trying to dig their way out of it because they see that the rest of the world's gone by and that they're left way behind. They may have won the war, but they've lost the peace. And so they're now trying to get it back some kind of relationship, but they're still stumbling around and doing it little by little by little. Now, did our government do enough? I think our government, we signed a peace agreement purely to get the POWs out. Did we get them all out? There are allegations that maybe some were left. We know one was left who had become a traitor and lived with the, with the enemy, the Marine Garwood, but uh, he came out to, several years ago. I don't think they're any more there, quite frankly, and I come to that from a, two points of view. First, there's no evidence of any, and secondly, if the Vietnamese had more of our prisoners, they would be using them in the same way that they used the prisoners in earlier times to get more out of us. And since they don't use them, I just don't think they have. Now, we have a lot of discrepancies, people we know that were alive on the ground, we don't know what happened to them. 
the Vietnamese have gradually begun to shake out some, some uh, documents to tell us what happened to some of them. We now are getting some separate documents out of Russia that don't seem to match at all in terms of the numbers they talk about with even our figures. So it's a very messy and confused situation. And meanwhile, as you saw the other day, the president has extended the embargo on American trade with Vietnam in order to keep that pressure still on them. Mr. Colby, I'm uh, Dolph Droge of Washington, D.C., and we have crossed trails uh, in Vietnam and elsewhere. Uh, you were associated with the first program to target the communist cadre infrastructure of the communist operations in the South. It was called the Phoenix Program. It is still one of the most controversial discussions among the critics of the policy and the supporters of the policy. Could you explain to this audience what the purpose of the program was and how the program was carried out and what your estimate is of the effectiveness of what was, in my opinion, the only political revolutionary warfare offensive directly aimed at strictly the Communist Party membership, which never totaled more than 6% in terms of the traditional organization. Thank you. We have a, an old saying in Washington that your friends ask you the best questions so that you can answer them. And uh, that was a very apt question. I was hoping somebody would ask about the Phoenix because I have to answer for it. There's been so much baloney passed around about it that it needs an authoritative answer. What was the Phoenix program? We had identified the nature of the enemy. They had a command and control network operating secretly throughout the population of South Vietnam. It was the leadership element of the revolutionary effort against the government. These were people trying to overthrow the government. They were trying to assert authority over the people instead of the government's authority. They were the enemy, no question about it. Now, they were secret. How do you get them? Well, you have to do intelligence work to find out who they are. You have to do meticulous intelligent work of getting a little report from one side, a little report from another, a little report from another. Interrogations to find out who the people knew when they worked in the guerrilla squads, who were the leaders of the squad. Make dossiers of these people so that you know who they are. Once you know who they are, and they're not just shadowy the communists, but they are specific individuals, then you can worry about what you can do about them. Obviously, you want to capture them. Obviously, you'd be very happy if they would defect to you, surrender to you, if you will. And we made all sorts of offers that if they would come in, we didn't care what crime they had committed in the past, they would be freed of it. We put posters up in South Vietnam with their pictures on. And at the bottom of it, it didn't say wanted, dead, or alive. It said, Mr. Nguyen, if you see this, you come on in and you will not be punished for any crime you may have committed. And that was an open poster in the area. And some were killed. Most of the killed were killed in the course of military battles. If a fight took place outside the village tonight between an enemy guerrilla squad and the local self-defense group in the village, people would be killed on both sides. And you'd go out in the morning and you'd see the body of one of your people in the village. And he had been killed. You saw this other body, which you identified as Mr. Nguyen. Now, he hadn't been captured. He hadn't come over to our side. He was killed. So he was reported as killed. And a lot of them were killed in that kind of a court. Now, my problem with the testimony was that I was never able to say not one was ever wrongfully killed. I don't think you can say that about the war in Vietnam or Bosnia or World War II or any time. But I did, I did take steps to minimize that as much as possible. We required, for instance, three reports before a person could be named as a member of the apparatus. We required that our interrogations be decent. CIA teaches that if you want good intelligence, you better use good inter interrogation methods, not bad ones, because you'll get bad intelligence. And we've applied that in various parts of the world. And we insisted that these people be handled properly and taken care of if they defected. Uh, they would be held if they were captured, but then reviewed legally to see that they could be properly held 
because there was evidence against them. This was an attempt to reduce the power of the central apparatus of the enemy. I'll leave to Stan Farno to tell you what a communist leader in North Vietnam told him many years later, that the Phoenix program was the most effective program used against them during the war, much more effective than divisions attacking them. I frankly think they made a mistake. I think that the communists have confused the Phoenix program with the pacification program, which was the program of organizing the villages to defend themselves. Yes, that was effective against them. I never thought the Phoenix program was all that effective. It had some impact, no question about it. It was an essential target against this leadership that was running the war against the South Vietnamese people. One, one follow-up. Was it turned over to the Vietnamese as we phased out? Yes. And did they conduct it with the same standards you have described? Well, uh, it was turned over to them gradually. Uh, we had done all we could to educate them into our style on it. I won't say that all Vietnamese applied our standards, either in the military or in the civilian, but we certainly did our best to train them up in the values of doing it properly. We trained a legal uh, cadre to act as the legal controls over the exercise of the program, things of that nature. No, I I, we didn't control it after we left. I couldn't answer that. Thank you. Thank you. Colonel, your question. Welcome to Hamlet Sydney. Delighted to see you here. Thank you, sir. I'm Gus Frankie from Atlanta, Georgia. Sir, would you please comment uh, on the effectiveness of the Army soldier during that time period, say from 67 to 72, in the field, the problems of the leadership, and the problem presented by the one-year rotation, and as alluded to in earlier, uh, some of the political restrictions that they faced in, in waging campaigns? The U.S. Army. Yes. Sir. Yes. Um, well, as usual, I always found American soldiers darn good. Uh, they went through a terrible period. Uh, they were infected by the feeling in America that the, the thing was useless and it didn't have any reason, we didn't have a reason to be there, the anti-war movement and so forth, and, and the broader feeling of, of malaise. I stood on a parapet in a little outpost one night up in central Vietnam and I was standing next to this soldier who was on guard for the night. And I was just chatting with him in the evening. And he turned to me at one point. He said, what are we doing here anyway? I said, well, we're here to help defend South Vietnam against this communist attack here. He says, ah, oh, you know, we don't have any business out here. And I said, well, yes, you do. I mean, we have to fight this kind of a problem on a worldwide scale. and we." do better to fight it away from our shores than on our shores. And he said, well, I don't know about that. I, well, I said, well, how about Europe? Do you think we ought to be there? No. That surprised me a little bit. And I said, well, uh, how about Canada? Should we be there if there were problems? No. I was tempted to say, how about New Jersey? <laughs> and uh, that was the feeling of that soldier. And yet, did he do his duty that night? Darn right he did did it very well. The army went through a terrible problem with drugs in Vietnam. It got out, totally out of hand, and uh, the army did the best it could to get control of that problem. But it was a reflection of a doubt among the American people. The army reflects our people. If our people are gung-ho, the army will be gung-ho. If our people don't want any part of it, the army will be affected by that attitude. As for too many controls, the comment used to be that there were three places on the average uh, fighter bomber. One was for the pilot, one was for the bombardier, and one was for the lawyer, who went along to show them where, the, where they could bomb and where they couldn't. A lot of those restrictions were, in my opinion, silly. Uh, we went through an exquisite intellectual exercise for about a year or so, in which we would go north by one geographic degree in our bombing, and then we go another one. And this was to give the enemy the message that they ought to quit. Well, as I said, I never thought that they were going to quit, and they didn't. I tell one of the most uh, apt remarks was made by President Nixon a few years ago in an interview in which 
They asked him whether he would have done anything different in his past. And he mused a moment, and he said, yes. I should have bombed in 69 the way I did in 72. And you know, there's a lot of truth to that. That was a very apt remark. Uh, we didn't for all sorts of political reasons. The political weakness of our government in the face of the opposition in the country to the war. So I understand these problems, but no, I think the, the one-year tour for soldiers was all right. To a certain extent, the officers went for a bit longer, but a lot of them just went for a year or a year and a half. I would have preferred to see the officers stay at least two or three years, because if you're in command of a brigade for six months, as some of them were, you barely assert command before you're on your way out. And the troops don't have much confidence in you if, you knew they're gonna, if they know they're going to get another commander in another six months. They figure, well, I'll just get through this one, and then we'll have to get through the next one. And the new guy always comes with all sorts of ideas to do new things, and the troops finally get sick and tired of that. So I think the Army made a mistake with the short terms for the officers, although the men, I think you could have, it's, you, you have to share the responsibility around among Americans for going out on point and getting shot at every day. And it was every day in many of those units. So. Uh, now I stand, uh, I'll let nobody stand in front of me and say that the American soldiers aren't good soldiers. They are good soldiers. Thank you. Thank you. Jim? I'm Jim Bullington, retired Foreign Service Officer. At the very end, Mr. Kobe, I'm talking about uh, early 75, after the fall of the Central Highlands, certainly after the fall of Wei and Da Nang, the end result was obvious. Could we not at that point have negotiated a more graceful exit than what occurred, under which we could have evacuated some of our Vietnamese employees, for example, and others to whom we had obligations. And if we could have, why didn't we? Uh, various people advocated that we try, and they did try. We had an American CIA officer who was of, of Hungarian extraction. He talked to the Hungarian diplomats in Saigon and tried to set up a relationship of negotiation. I had no objection to their doing it, but uh, I had no faith in it. Our American ambassador in the last period thought sure he could arrange some better way of having it than fall. My intelligence appreciation sitting in Washington was that the enemy was on a roll and they weren't going to accept anything but victory. And that's what happened. And I can understand, you know, they'd been at it for 14 years. And so they, uh, they kept on rolling as hard as they could. So, no, I don't think it was feasible to work out anything at that stage since the enemy was so clearly being victorious. Thank you. Next question here. You are next, sir. My name is Son Pham. I'm the former uh, South Vietnamese fighter pilot. I have two questions, uh, if you don't mind. Please. Uh, the first question relates to the death of President Jim and his brother Yu. Uh, we have uh, three theories within our Vietnamese community. One is both of them get killed because of accidentally get killed or spontaneous um, reaction from the low rank officer. Second is, is killed by the U.S. conspiracy. And the third is the kill because of the sloppiness of Kennedy administration to handle the coup d'etat. When Robert McNamara go to snowing, uh, go to skiing at Colorado, when uh, President Kennedy go to a birthday party of his mother, uh, when the uh, Joint Chief of Staff General go to play golf at Pathetra, uh, Maryland. In the position of the former CIA director, and what theory do you think is correct? Well, they weren't killed by happenstance. They were killed deliberately. They were not killed by a, a number of younger Vietnamese officers that I know. Uh, they certainly were not killed by President Kennedy's order or even inattention. The answer is President Kennedy did not anticipate that President Xiem would be killed. Now, whether he should have feared it or not, he did not. He did not think that President Xiem would be killed. 
in the course of the coup. Neither did the other generals who participated in the coup. I've talked to several of the generals who were part of the coup, and several of them had told me that they went in on the coup on condition that President Siam not be killed. I won't say so much for, for, for his brother Nu. There's a lot of hatred of, of, of Nu. But on condition that Ziem not be killed. Ziem was killed as the direct order of General Zhuang Van Min himself, who sent his aide out, Major Zhuang, I think it was, Zhuang, uh, who sent his aide out to join the group of APCs, Armored Personnel Carriers, bringing the President and his brother back to the General Staff Headquarters. He went out and joined that group. He got in the tank with the two brothers and shot them both a number of times and even stabbed them. Uh, he then came back, and I know that he reported when he got back, he walked into the room where an American officer actually was and heard him say, Mission accompli. My mission is accomplished. So there's no question in my mind as to how they were killed. You had a second question, sir. Yes, sir. The second question is uh, in the third phase of the war, you're talking about the, uh, the trip you made in a motorcycle with your friend across the countryside. Uh, you think you have that trip or you know, the countryside very much in the peaceful because of uh, we win the people war or just the tactic of the communists to let the American people believe the Vietnamization is success and completely pull out and give zero support to the South Vietnamese troops, then they get back later and finish it up. Uh, what do you think? Do we, do you think which one is correct or we just subjectively you think we win the people I, war? I think they were pushed out. The uh, communists are very tough and they would not have given up the power that they had, if they had the power. Uh, I went down in Long An province where General Wilson and I had spent some time earlier in 1971, and I said, where is the Central Committee to my people there? They said, oh, it's living over in Cambodia. I said, what do you mean it's living over in Cambodia? Well, they can't live here in Long An province where the communists had been very strong until Colonel General Wilson got there and they turned out to be not so strong after he got to work on them. Well, I'm joking a little bit, but the fact is, no, the communists did not run a stratagem of apparently withdrawing in order to mislead the American people, no. They, uh, they held on to every power they had. And they violated their own doctrine when they turned to a soldier's war. They violated the doctrine of the people's war because they lost it, and they had to look for something else to do. Thank you. Thank Thanks you for the question. Thank you. Next question, please. I'm Todd Reed, a sophomore here at Hampton, Sydney. Um, Dr. Rostow said earlier this afternoon that if the United States had sent troops into Laos to block the Ho Chi Minh Trail, um, we effectively could have shut down the, the pipeline to South Vietnam from North Vietnam. Do you think that if American troops had left the borders of Vietnam, it would have served to deter the North Vietnamese or would have only have escalated the war to a higher point and bringing in other enemies? My own view, frankly, is that the American troops could have gone over into Laos in much more size than they did. Some of our special operations people did go over from time to time on raids and that sort of thing. No question about it, and uh, they did a little good there. But there was no attempt to absolutely block the, the, uh, the passage of the Ho Chi Minh Trail. I think the, the estimate was that if we did that openly, again I say openly, uh, that that would have been a violation of the agreement we made in 1962 to recognize an independent and neutral Laos. We made that agreement with the Russians, among other people. The only people who didn't abide by it were the North Vietnamese. But an attempt by us overtly to go into North Vietnam at that stage could have gotten the Soviets back in the act in the direct way in which they already had been in, in the 1960 period. Soviet Air Force was flying in, in Laos, resupplying people and that sort of thing. They withdrew when, when we made that first agreement. And I think our government's view was 
that we really didn't want to upset the Russians to make this a confrontation between the Russians and the Americans. Uh, that stemmed from the agreement really reached between Kennedy and Khrushchev, which said they were going to have to have their confrontations, but for God's sake, let's not do it in Laos. It's too far away for both of them. And so I think that's the explanation. Eventually, of course, the Vietnamese ran a major uh, effort across in the spring of 1971 into the Ho Chi Minh Trail area. It turned out to be a mess. It didn't work well at all, and it was essentially a defeat for the South Vietnamese Army at that stage. They did better the following year, but that, that operation was not a success. Thank you. Next question, please. Yes, sir. Bill Mitchell, Farmville, Virginia. I was wondering, how much do you feel Lyndon Johnson, was he holding Mr. Westmoreland in check? Do you feel like it would have had any effect on the outcome if Westmoreland had been given more free hand? That's a tough question. Uh, President Johnson was, again, operating within the constraints of we don't want this war to get outside Vietnam. We want it just to be something in Vietnam. And therefore, Westmoreland was constrained to operate only within Vietnam. There were various debates as to whether we should invade into North Vietnam and cut off a certain portion of the southern part of North Vietnam and to carry the Ho Chi Minh uh, Trail. Those were discussed, considered, and turned down by the political leadership at various times. The model was, of course, the Inchon landing in Korea that really was very successful when, when General MacArthur did that. And I think General Westmoreland may have been, he would have been perfectly good doing it. He was a first class soldier, there's no question about it. Uh, whether it would have changed the nature, I'm not so sure because at that time that it was really under consideration, the battle in South Vietnam was essentially within South Vietnam. It had to be won in South Vietnam before you could do anything else. As long as they were running free in South Vietnam, you could fool around with the lines of supply and it wouldn't make much difference. So uh, I think the key there was when we finally turned to that twin strategy of pacification and building the Vietnamese services and getting our own troops out, that we had a strategy that made sense. Prior to that time, General Westmoreland was there to put his finger in the dike and to keep the thing from going under. He ran a number of successful attacks, the Yadrong Valley and others, but they essentially didn't amount to much because the enemy would just go away and then come back. Thank you. Your question, please, ma'am. Um, yes, I'm a sophomore at Randolph-Macon Women's College. Um, sorry. Um, my name is Juanita Giles. Um, I'll be the first to admit that I don't know enough about the strategics of the Vietnam War to ask a military-based question. but. Um, in the past, before Vietnam and after, the United States seems to be a country that begs forgiveness quite often. And I have a good friend who is a psychologist who works with veterans of Vietnam, and I was wondering if you think that militarily and an attitude here in the United States, if the United States as a whole needs to beg forgiveness. No, I don't think so. I don't beg for forgiveness. I am sorry we made mistakes in the way we did our work there, uh, in the tactics and strategies that we followed because they were not effective. But as for our resolution to help the people in South Vietnam defend themselves against aggression, I think that made sense. You say, well, why Vietnam? It's so far away. But during the Cold War, Every little local dispute like that became a subset of the overall Soviet-American confrontation worldwide. Now that doesn't exist. Sarajevo is a disaster today, but it's not going to produce World War III because the great powers are not lined up on opposite sides. They're on the same side. And therefore, during the Cold War period, I think it was appropriate to apply even to places like Vietnam and other parts of the world, the overall strategy of containment. George Kennan wrote an article in 1947. He's an expert on the Soviet Union. He said, if we can contain the outward thrust of communism, it will have to change inside. Well, it took 40 odd years for that to come true, 
but it did come true. We did successfully can contain the expansion of communism worldwide, and eventually it collapsed. But, uh, and I think that strategy was appropriate. Does the America have to apologize for winning the Cold War? Not by a long shot. We were right all the time. Now, whether we did the right... Thank you. Thank you. Next question here, please. Monroe Lee, Washington. Uh, my question is really about the uh, limitations which we imposed on ourselves as a result of the Geneva Accords. It's quite clear that the communists did not respect them in Vietnam, and yet we respected that uh, parallel of latitude. 17. And uh, yet in Korea, we were able to use our naval power with great effectiveness because we could go behind the enemy lines. How much difference did that make in your judgment in the conduct of the war in Vietnam? Well, I think that you forget that one of the dominant factors affecting the minds of most of the American leadership in Vietnam was the Korean experience particularly when we went north of the 38th parallel and brought in the Chinese. That was the nightmare that Lyndon Johnson had in his mind, that if we got too far into North Vietnam, we could do a little bombing here and there, but if we really got in there, could we perhaps trigger a Chinese participation in the war, as we had done with China during the Korean War. So that limited us to staying out of, Viet of North Vietnam, except for the occasional bombing, which didn't have that much effect, as you know. Uh, the various degrees, you can go one degree further, 20th parallel, 21st parallel, all that sort of thing. You can bomb certain places and not others. All of that uh, was sort of a pain to the pilots. I don't think it made much difference one way or the other in the, in the outcome of the war. I mean, it. There was one period in which we were debating whether to bomb at all in uh, 1965 and 66. And at one point I lost patience with it. I said to a friend of mine, will they please go bomb something and get it out of their system? I don't care what they bomb. Just get it out of their system and then we can go back to the real war in the villages. And, you know, we didn't. <laughs> uh, could I have a follow-up question which will reveal my ignorance of the geography? But assuming that we had been able to land forces north of the parallel, could we have made quick thrusts which would have cut the Ho Chi Minh Trail, for example? Yes. There is a North Vietnam down at the area of a town called Vinh, which is about a quarter of the way up North Vietnam. It's very narrow. It's not quite as narrow as Israel, but uh, it's very narrow. Uh, and there's a pass there called the Mujia Pass that the Vietnamese were using as a route into the Ho Chi Minh. It wasn't the only way into the Ho Chi Minh Trail, but it was one of the principal ones they used. And uh, that would have been fairly easy for an expeditionary force to land in the vicinity of Vinh, cut off the southern part of, of North Vietnam, move over, and cut off the Ho Chi Minh Trail. I think you would have had to go all the way to the Mekong to make it effective, because they would have gone around you. Each time you went a little further, they'd go around you. They were very flexible. But uh, that was, of course, the idea of the McNamara Line at one point, to put a line across Vietnam at the 17th parallel. Uh, but it ran into this problem of openly operating in Laos, which nobody quite dared do. And the Vin idea ran against the problem of would you would you uh, stimulate a Chinese reaction in addition to the Russian reaction? Sir, Jerry. Yes, sir, Mr. Colby. My name is Jerry Fogel. I'm a retired Navy captain. I'm one of those frustrated pilots who bombed around Vin and needed that lawyer in the back seat to tell me what I could and couldn't <laughs> shoot at. Uh, my compatriot... That wasn't, that wasn't a, a fancy story. It was a true no, story. True. You had yes, the lawyers. Sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> Uh, my compatriot from Vietnam asked the question I had intended. However, 
I was also on the ground for a year and 13 days in three and four corps when you and Mr. Van made your excursion. Uh, be advised, in case you didn't know, there was protection on the ground for I'm you sure at the there time. Was. I'm sure there was. Uh, I was with a special ops group that operated in other countries, and uh, we, we operated with Air America. Would you care to discuss Air America's role, uh, sure. which was a part of your organization? Glad to. Air America was a, quote, private, unquote, corporation. Uh, it so happened that CIA owned all, all the stock through a series of dummies. Uh, it was set up to provide private transport, air transport, not U.S. military transport. There were certain situations where you, you'll take a chance of somebody being shot down. If it's a civilian that's captured, you can say, oh, I don't know anything about him. If it's an officer of the United States Army that's captured, both you're embarrassed and you have an enormous obligation to get him out of there. Uh, and therefore, there are certain situations, like the U-2 originally, which we pretended was a private corporation, set up a, an elaborate corporate structure to show that it wasn't part of the government. Gary Powers did, was not a government employee. He was a contract employee, things of that nature. And Air America, the same. When we ran into a requirement for air transport to support guerrillas, to drop agents, that sort of thing, in China, in Southeast Asia, Laos, Vietnam, we developed this ostensibly private company to do it so that the United States military would not be involved, particularly in Laos, where the military were not allowed to appear for many years. We could use these aircraft, and they were civilian. See, they weren't military at all. And they, we recruited pilots uh, who were a very fine bunch of people, absolutely courageous and fearless, uh, going, you have no idea the flying conditions of Mount, well, maybe you do, the flying conditions around Laos with the, the karst mountains sticking up with the, with the clouds all around them and you're flying right into them. I remember flying with one Air America pilot one time and we couldn't get, to, we couldn't see the airfield. So he said, well, let's go over here and we'll go down until we hit the river and then we'll go at, at wave top height, literally, along the river for about 20 miles and then we'll find the airfield. And the ceiling was about 100 feet. So we were flying under the 100-foot ceiling on the river, and he knows what he was doing. I didn't know what he was doing, but he knew what he was doing. And sure enough, we found the airfield and plunked onto it. I mean, these were great pilots. There had been a lot of nonsense and a lousy movie written about how there were a bunch of drunks and drug runners and all that, which is absolutely false. We had very strong regulations against any drugs appearing on the Air America planes. We shook down some of the tribal people who were flying on it. We would take it away from them if we found it, throw it away, that sort of thing. So I can say that we did not transport drugs. I can't say the same for Air Laos, nor for the Royal Lao, Lao Army, but I know that the tribal people that we supported were not engaged in it. Thank you. Johnny. I'm the bombed around Vin and needed that lawyer in the back seat to tell me what I could and couldn't <laughs> shoot at. Uh, my compatriot. That wasn't, that wasn't a, a fancy story. It was a true no, story. True. You had yes, the lawyers. Sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> Uh, my compatriot from Vietnam asked the question I had intended. However, I was also on the ground for a year and 13 days in three and four corps when you and Mr. Van made your excursion. Uh, be advised, in case you didn't know, there was protection on the ground for I'm you sure at the there time. Was. I'm sure there was. Uh, I was with a special ops group that operated in other countries, and uh, we, we operated with Air America. Would you care to discuss Air America's role, uh, sure. which was a part of your organization? Glad to. Thank you. Air America was a, quote, private, unquote, corporation. Uh, it so happened that CIA owned all, all the stock through a series of dummies. Uh, it was set up to provide private transport, air transport, not U.S. military transport. There were certain situations where you, 
you'll take a chance of somebody being shot down. If it's a civilian that's captured, you can say, oh, I don't know anything about him. If it's an officer of the United States Army that's captured, both you're embarrassed and you have an enormous obligation to get him out of there. Uh, and therefore, there are certain situations like the U-2 originally, which we pretended was a private corporation, set up an elaborate corporate structure to show that it wasn't part of the government. Gary Powers did, was not a government employee. He was a contract employee, things of that nature. And Air America, the same. When we ran into a requirement for air transport to support guerrillas, to drop agents, that sort of thing, in China, in Southeast Asia, Laos, Vietnam, we developed this ostensibly private company to do it so that the United States military would not be involved, particularly in Laos, where the military were not allowed to appear for many years. We could use these aircraft, and they were civilian. See, they weren't military at all. And they, we recruited pilots uh, who were a very fine bunch of people, absolutely courageous and fearless, uh, going, you have no idea the flying conditions of Mount, well, maybe you do, the flying conditions around Laos with the, the karst mountains sticking up with the, with the clouds all around them and you're flying right into them. I remember flying with one Air America pilot one time and we couldn't get, to, we couldn't see the airfield so he said, well, let's go over here and we'll go down until we hit the river and then we'll go at, at wave top height, literally, along the river for about 20 miles and then we'll find the airfield. And the ceiling was about 100 feet. So we were flying under the 100 foot ceiling on the river and he knew what he was doing. I didn't know what he was doing, but he knew what he was doing. And sure enough, we found the airfield and plunked onto it. I mean, these were great pilots. There had been a lot of nonsense and a lousy movie written about how there were a bunch of drunks and drug runners and all that, which is absolutely false. We had very strong regulations against any drugs appearing on the Air America planes. We shook down some of the tribal people who were flying on it. We would take it away from them if we found it, throw it away, that sort of thing. So I can say that we did not transport drugs. I can't say the same for Air Laos, nor for the Royal Lao, Lao Army, but I know that the tribal people that we supported were not engaged in it. Thank you. Charlie. I'm Charlie Hamiller, a freshman at Hampton, Sydney. Uh, I've read in several sources that before the Americans began to Vietnamize the war, there was, there was much confrontation between South Vietnamese officers and the American pacification advisors. What effect did this have on the American uh, strategy and why didn't the government, why, why did the government put up with these conflicts? Well, you have to remember that we were trying to build a South Vietnamese government. We weren't trying to exert authority ourselves. We were trying to support the Vietnamese authorities to round their, their, their their legitimacy and all the rest of it. So we couldn't just give them orders. You had to use a little diplomacy to try to convince them to do something. And with President Wilson, you have an expert on doing that sort of thing. And occasionally, you'd get a South Vietnamese officer that was no damn good, was a coward or corrupt or whatever. And then we finally arranged an arrangement where our, our local advisors could advise our pacification headquarters and I would go over to the palace and I would say, this guy is hopeless. You gotta get rid of him, Mr. President. And they would normally get rid of him. Uh, but it would be the Vietnamese changing him. We would be reporting as a sort of an inspector general chain operating for the palace in that regard. Uh, I wouldn't say we won them all. There were some that were corrupt. There's no question about it. But uh, I think most of them were really quite good my experience, and particularly the province chiefs, I found was really quite effective. Some cheated, no question about it, but uh, most of them I think we got pretty good performance out of. We've come down to our last three questions. Counting down one over here. Good evening, I'm Wayne Hill, senior here at Hampton, Sydney. You spoke about the doubt here in America. I was wondering how uh, the, you spoke about the, what? the doubt here in America oh, yeah. Yeah. and how the administra administration might have uh, addressed that. 
doubt to change the outcome of the war? By having a better strategy. Americans will support a war which is short and successful, the Gulf War. They will support a war which is long if there is clear progress, World War II, even Korea. What they won't support is a long war with a lot of casualties with apparently inconclusive results. Americans are pragmatists. They say, look, if we're going to put this kind of a effort and blood and money into this and it isn't working, let's stop. And that's where the doubt came from, the feeling that we had all those troops there and they really weren't being effective. Now that was reinforced by the famous Chet 68 attack, which as I said was when it came across wrong here, but that's what happened. Thank you. The last question here. Uh, James Smiley, Richmond, Virginia. I was interested in not only your point uh, at one place where you suggested that there was some fakery in terms of the pacification, pacification program, and then in the question you asked just to answer just a few minutes ago about uh, the CIA and uh, dummy organizations. Uh, I'm interested in the growth of cynicism in the American public about the war uh, and how that might have been related to what we could believe from our officials about what was going on in the war. I realize, of course, that sometimes lies have to be told in the case of national security. But it seems to me that in the anti-war movement and in a lot of Americans, we just didn't know sometimes what was true about the pacification programs or the body counts and so on. Would you have something to say? You know, Cicela Bach has written about lying and when the government can lie and how often it can lie and what lying does to a body politic and so on. So would you reflect for us on the problem of disinformation of the enemy, which then disinforms us and so right. on? Would we? Yeah. You raise a very interesting question. I have always tried to follow the system of not telling an actual lie. I've tried on many occasions not to tell the whole truth either. But what I've said has been normally true. Uh, the most famous example of that was a newsman got me at a point from which we were raising a Russian submarine from the seabed of the Pacific. And this newsman said, I understand that you guys are raising a Russian submarine in the Atlantic. And I said, that's absolutely false. Well, it was absolutely false. We weren't doing it in the Atlantic. We were doing it in the Pacific. Luckily, he didn't ask the next question, but perhaps because I was so forceful in the way I turned that one down. But there are deceptions that you do run. I mean, I've lived as different uh, names and, and identities and all the rest of it, and met people under other names and that sort of thing. That's a deception. It's not true, of course, but it's, I don't think it's hurting anybody particularly. Uh, obviously, a spy does something illegal. I've conducted spying. I guess I'm a co-conspirator in spying in various situations around the world. Uh, but a uh, now, I'll distinguish a deception of the enemy or even of a foreign situation with a deception of the American people. And that I don't think you can get away with. You shouldn't and I don't think it'll work. It's been tried, of course. We have the spin doctors who work in, all day on this sort of thing, trying to get the right spin on something. They try not to tell a lie, but they sure don't tell the whole truth from time to time. And uh, that's part of American politics. There's no question of that. So I think caveat emptor, the buyer has to beware of the advertiser, of the government official, of the politician, of the intelligence officer. But uh, the one thing we had was an absolute rule within the intelligence community is that if you have to give the false impression to an enemy or to another country, you damn well will report accurately and honestly to your own bosses. And that includes the president and the director and all that sort of thing. And I think we've got a pretty good record on that of speaking honestly. The best example, I think, is the Pentagon Papers, 
that will be discussed in this session, I'm sure, which uh, if you look at them, you'll see that the estimates turned in by CIA during the war, up to 68, turned out to be pretty good. They were not optimistic. They weren't very welcome to President Johnson, but they were our best opinion of how well the situation was going, and it was bad. And this was reported to President Johnson very straight, even though he was not a man that you really wanted to tell bad news to. Thank you. We have our last question over here. Mr. Colby, my name is Alex Calfee. I'm a member of the sophomore class here at Hampton Sydney. And I was just interested in sort of tying into the future here. We have uh, several different areas of concern in, in the world right now, Somalia and Bosnia. And do you think we've learned our lesson regarding support of the countries that we are militarily involved in after we, we withdraw our military support? I mean, do you think we, we've learned to stay in the country and, and support them and help them develop a government? That's a very good question, and it's a tough one. Uh, to a degree, yes. But, uh, no, if the American people turn rather generally against something, then we're going get, to get away from it. It depends on the political attitude here in this country, it seems to me. Uh, some of our successes have been where we stayed. Some of our failures have been where we left. Uh, and we've had some bad results of where we left sometimes in terms of large numbers of refugees, of human rights abuses after we've gone and so forth. Uh, is that a firm lesson in the American body politic? No, because every day is a new day and every generation is a new generation and they look at the problem as they see it at the moment. And does this make sense? And if it doesn't seem to make sense to them, they won't support it. And uh, you have to say that if that's a weakness of democracy, so be it. Democracy has an awful lot of strength, an awful lot of strength, and we can stand a few weaknesses. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Ambassador, there's nothing I can say after that except to say as we, as we speak down here in Southside, Virginia, much obliged. Thank you. General Sam said that to me one time about 17 years ago when he bid me farewell as Director of Central Intelligence, and I've never forgotten it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.